From the United Nations Office to the African Union, this is She Stands for Peace. I am Dr. Yemisi Akimbobola, and in this podcast, I speak with thought leaders and peace builders who share their reflections and best practices towards achieving objectives of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in Africa. In this episode, I'm joined by Sarah Muhoya, coordinator of the Democracy Trust Fund in Kenya, as well as the head of positioning and democracy at Echo Network Africa. And we have a conversation about women's equal participation in electoral processes in Africa for political stability and sustainable peace. Good morning, Sarah Mhoya. It's a pleasure to speak with you this morning. Kenya's 2022 election witnessed an increase in the participation of women that vied for in various positions. 30 female MPs were elected to the National Assembly compared to 23 in the 2017 election and even fewer in the 2013 election. There were also seven female governors elected compared to three in 2017. But beyond those elected, there were also far more women vying for positions too, with three out of four vice presidential candidates being women, and even more contests for gubernatorials. So now, there are several African countries that have gender quotas, and I think Kenya is a clear example of um, one that is working towards achieving that. And whilst the country is still working to meet its two-third gender principle as prescribed in the 2010 constitution, it is significantly progressing forward. So the question here is, tell us all the groundworks. I can imagine there's a lot of groundwork that led to this, that got us here. What has been the groundwork um, done to achieve this significant progress? Thank you very much, Yemise. This is very, very exciting um, to just have to have this conversation, especially so early when we're beginning to uh, get on to our second round or what would call season two. So to come straight to your question, first, we agreed as uh, women rights organizations and our development partners, especially the UN women, uh, Hans Saido and Uraya and other organizations that support women's um, participation in politics, we agreed that we're going to give this a cyclical approach as opposed to an event so that we're looking at elections not as an event but as a cycle that it is from a to z everything counts that's what we agreed that's our starting point second thing that we agreed is that it's very important to um, acknowledge that even though we have a very very progressive provision and provisions on women's political rights. Most of them, and in fact, the most important one, which is the rule that's got to do with the um, not the more than two thirds gender rule anchored in our constitution, that that rule hasn't worked. This is 15 years since the promulgation of our constitution in 2010. And so we came into the 2022 general election without a full implementation of that a particular provision. Therefore, we knew that we were not going to uh, depend on the law. So we fell back on a number of things. One, we fell back on the realization that if you post in many well-prepared women into the electoral pipeline, you are more likely to, to benefit and you're more likely to harvest more women in the, at the end of the pipeline. So sponsor as many women as possible in all the six levels. Sponsor as many women as running mates to the governors and to the presidential contestants. And that way, we were sure that we would get more women elected. So we launched what we called Chagua Mama, elect a woman. And this had absolutely nothing to do with any particular woman. It was our campaign for positioning women across board, across all the political parties, so that they could, we could have a pool of women running. But beyond that, we also decided to train them for the first time. We developed, together with the Ministry of Gender, we developed a curriculum um, that would train and equip the women 
with political education, sufficient capacity to run successfully. So we called it running to win. So through these two campaigns, we were able to not only prepare the women, but we were also able to build a pool. But thirdly, and even also very important, we also encourage the women through the democracy trust fund to save for their own campaign. And so we challenge the women to own their campaigns, save for their monies, and of course then other lobbying and advocacy around the electoral environments and so on and so forth, and reducing gender-based violence and bringing in other actors like the media, making sure that everybody was focused on having well-prepared, well-equipped women who had some resources to run a successful campaign. And therefore, the Chagua Mama campaign was our rallying call throughout the 2022 general election. Thank you. And it's great that we see the numbers as a result of this, this campaign. But what was the reality for those women in, in terms of the build up to and also during the election? How did it actually play out for them in reality? Very, very uh, critical question, MEC. Number one, the, our electoral environment is still very, very much um, against the, the, the participation of women. First, there is so much, there's been, there was so much violence across board, affecting the men, affecting the women, but of course affecting the women the most. So that was one. And this violence was not just verbal, it was it was in totality it was it was also driven by social media and so because kenya is such a highly computerized and tech society social media played a very very negative role in this case in um, in the abuses and in the in depicting women as lesser candidates. And, and this worked against the women candidates. It also worked against the programming for them. And eventually, of course, some of the women dropped out. Uh, so the, the, the usual verbal accu accusations. And number two, our electoral system is expensive. Running to for political office in Kenya is extremely expensive, and therefore, you know, competing resources and just inadequate resources. And, you know, you're not just talking about the allowable uh, campaign expenses. You're talking about other hidden costs that come in with, you know, reaching the ground, the electorate, and the demands by the electorate, and so on and so forth. But number three, which was also equally very important is the um, coalition formations. So, you know, you've been investing as a woman in a particular political party, and then suddenly there were collisions found, uh, formed, to, usually towards the end, like three, four, five months. And what that meant, even though there is a law on coalition building, even though there is all of that, the female candidate is still not seen as the star candidate. And therefore, a lot of women got dropped off. So really I miss it, the environment, the electoral environment is still very harsh, it's still very, very unconducive for, for the running of women and the participation of women. And that was not different. And this is even more for young women. So we had very few young women under the age of 35 running. We even fewer women with disabilities. So we do need to put in our energies to reform the retro environment to make it a little bit better, less stressful for the women, and also reduce the cost uh, for campaigns in our country. So you spoke about the role of your, the campaign in preparing the women to, uh, for elections, but how prepared were they in dealing with the kind of challenges that then emerged when they were participating? From where we sit as the, as, as the teams that were supporting the women, sometimes you think you've prepared them and then suddenly a lot of things come up. So I would say that in a sense, the women were better prepared than other elections that I have participated in since 2020 to 1997 and all of that. But in the end, the women were a little better off. They joined the Democracy Trust Fund early in 2020, 2020 actually, 
in 2021 all we did was to train and equip them and then 2022 they were they were roaring off but again you always have a lot of women who get to hear about these programs later and 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 late in the day but i would say that on a scale of one to five they probably were at three percent better prepared than all the other times. And there was also greater unity among the political parties. There was greater unity among women across the board. And I think that the presence of a unifying uh, organization, an institution that was uh, impartial and uh, not political and, and supporting all the women from all the political parties helped a great deal. To, to you know prepare the women and also the the collaboration between the um, the non state actors and the state actors we had a very very supportive cabinet secretary for gender in the name of professor margaret cobia who worked with us from a to z so yes i would say they were better prepared than other seasons and i know you you've, you've talked about how several organizations formed together to support women's participation but i wonder if there was any kind of advocacy issues that arose um during this time as well yes there were advocacy issues in fact we had um so what we called as as women rights organizations we had a seven point plan that we had were running around that revolved around issues of women's peace and security revolved around getting the women to be accepted by the society and, and the electorate and also the political parties. We had issues of, of justice in the courts. We even pushed for the formation of special courts to deal with uh, with people who would offend women or who would violate women. So we had we had as women rights organizations a seven point plan for uh, advocacy, but um, because the reform process stalled in 2021, those that advocacy got a little bit watered. So by the end of 2021, we really were just focusing more on getting the woman to run and focusing on the woman candidate more than reforming the environment. But yes, in the end, we had the coalition, um, the political parties act reformed slightly, which made it a little easier for women's participation and also for women-led political parties to become members and part of the coalitions that then have formed government. So there were advocacy issues which I think still need to engage us. So this is um, an ongoing concern for us. Earlier on, I'd mentioned that Kenya's 2010 constitution has a two-third gender principle. So what within the law exists to anchor these interventions to ensure that it's achieved, right? And we know that it's one thing to have laws and policies in place, but quite another thing to enforce them and put them into action. So perhaps you can also give some insights on how well the laws and policies are enacted in relation to these interventions. Um, indeed, we do have um, very, very uh, progressive socio-economic uh, political rights anchored in our 2010 constitution, but largely, you know, the socio-economic uh, protections and the provisions anchored on Article 43 of our constitution, those have not largely been achieved uh, for many, many reasons. And you see, they all come into play as women run for political office because it is these issues where you're talking about access to clean water, you're talking about access to affordable health care, you're talking about access to food. So you're dealing with an electorate that is still very, very hungry. You're still dealing with an electorate that has no access to all of these basic rights. And therefore, as a candidate, you're confronted by the realities of the electorate who then make demands on you that you cannot meet. So the failure to or the lack of in full implementation of those socioeconomic rights impaired the participation of women. But again, there are those provisions that deal specifically with the women's political rights. Uh, in our county assemblies, as you know, our country, our governance is 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 uh, comes into levels. There is the national government and the county government, which is which speak to each other. However, there are those uh, functions that were devolved and are devolved by the constitution 
to the county governments. And therefore, a lot of these needs that a woman, uh, um, a, a woman participating or seeking to participate in a contestant for that matter, um, gets confronted by are not are really completely outside of of her purview. There is very little she can do about it. And therefore, you're running for national political office and the functions that you need to be working on are devolved. So conflicts right there. But finally, I may say, because the greatest deficit is in the National Assembly. As you know, our parliament is, is bio. So we have the, the parliament, uh, uh, you know, being the duality of the Senate and then the National Assembly. Senate and county assembly seem to be okay because we have anchored affirmative action processes there in you know because we we do what we call the top ups and you can't constitute either the senate or the county assemblies before you provide nominations to bridge the deficits but there are other national assembly that is not the case and that is where we still have the biggest deficit which is why even though we have now made progress in 2013 as you rightly uh, pointed out we only had 16 women elected into the 290 constituencies. In 2017, we had 23 women. We lost one, and she was replaced by a male. And then today, in 2022, we have 30. But you see, you're talking about 30 out of 290. So we are still very, very far away. We have not implemented that clause in the National Assembly that in respect to bridging that gap. And that is because, and this is actually despite civil society is going to court, getting court orders, and the Supreme Court itself ruling that parliament should be declared as unconstitutional. But even then, you have all of these roadblocks, and parliament continues to just exist without the um, without meeting that that particular component in other national assemblies. So you may see that is a very huge challenge which we need to continue addressing as we move forward. Talking about moving forward, post-election um, for these women that were elected, what has been their experiences? And I know you spoke earlier on, for example, that during the elections they faced a lot of online abuse. So but post-election, what has been the realities for them? It's it's just amazing because this gender-based um, violence doesn't seem to end even after you have been elected. So even as we speak, we have a lot of women leaders who are still subjected to ridicule, to verbal abuse and all of that. And never mind that we actually have a law that can punish culprits, but to get it to bite is another thing. There is always an argument around it. So we do have that going on even with elected women and nominated women, especially nominated women, because when you're nominated, then you're called a flower girl. You didn't win your seat. You are you 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 are the the boy girlfriend to somebody you you slept your way around. You know the usual. And therefore, what we have, that is going on, and unfortunately, and we do need to put in mechanisms to deal with it, like within the confines of the law, but also to get the women properly educated so that they can really face this. But even more importantly, to get the women to develop some sort of uh, skin. So what we're doing as, um, as Echo Network Africa and the Democracy Trust Fund is that because we've realized that that need is so great and the women are caving in to the challenges of the, of the violence that are driven by social media, we have now decided to build in a new model into our curriculum dealing very specifically on these abuses, how you deal with them, how you mitigate, and what the law says, and what your avenues for redress are. So that's where we are at right now as we as we start to work on this next season. We we have things in place for the women, those women who were elected um, and, um, you know, initiatives have been developed to support them post-election. But what about the experiences of those women who went through the process but they were not successful in being elected. What has been their experience post-election? 
obviously you have more of those women. You have women who fell out just before the party nomination closed. So you have that huge block of women who were dropped. And there were really very many for the many reasons that I explained to you. And then you come in and have an additional um, number that then did not win in the or on the 9th of August. So you have two types of women um, at two levels. And so the loss is real. The loss is real for those women, whether you did not make it bef um, for the party primaries or whether you lost it at the general election, the loss is, is real and it's very personal. So a lot of those women have told us that they are bitter. They are bitter with the systems. They are very bitter with the electorate because, you know, as you go around, you know, people, the electorate promises to elect you and then they come over and they don't elect you. And so you're very bitter. So ha some have retreated completely now. So the feeling is the same across, but the feeling of loss. And immediately, Yamisi, what we did is that we convened um, a conference for the women who did not who lost the elections. Uh, at the party primaries, what we did is that we, we met them and encouraged them. We actually made them our champions. So we were able to very quickly harness their capacities and post them to where women were running. And we paid them. We had resources from our partners and we used their resources, their capacities to connect to the ground and their understanding of the, of the politics to set them to become our gender champions. And so at that point, we, we used them. And then those who lost the elections, we had a second meeting where we were just cancelling them. We actually hired a counsellor for them because some of them were suicidal. Some of them had no jobs. They had no money. They had spent everything they had. They had emotional breakdown. And so we needed to very quickly get them together and, and see how best to salvage them. A few of them, of course, wanted to go to court. But again, our court processes are expensive. So we weighed and gauged every situation on its own merit. And, um, and so that is an ongoing process. We're still working with them. Uh, but even better is that we have now enlisted all, most of them to the Democracy Trust Fund, and we intend to begin working with them on the ground to get them back on their feet. Um, but again, you still have all of those who decide, no, this is just too demoralizing. I will never go back. And so everybody's just going to deal with their pain, but we are doing our best to support them. If we're looking forward now towards 2027, what do you think could be done across? I mean, we've talked about Kenya as an example here today, but thinking more beyond Kenya um, and across the continent, what can we be done across the continent to make the electoral environment better and more secure for women and girls? And, you know, not just in terms of those who are going to be vying for office and preparing those ones for leadership, but also for voters themselves, right? And, you know, what would be at stake if the ground wasn't so well prepared? Thank you, Yamisa. That's a really good question. So uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give it a, a go. And first, I'll say to the voters, we need to get the voters to appreciate what it means to one miss out on the perspectives that women bring onto the table because women we know bring a different perspective they bring a different sort of value system to leadership so our society needs to understand that they actually lose on something and sometimes what we've done is to just confront our electorate with the issues of what happens when you don't have your sister, your mother, your grandmother, your female figure with you. They are just certain losses. So those losses, we need to help the electorate um, think about leadership in that simple manner. And that takes a lot of civic education. Number two, I think that the in our country at least, not electing women has very, very severe economic costs 
because at the county assembly you're going to have to bridge that gap so where you would have had 16 members of the county assemblies and you only elect uh, you elect now a woman then you're going to have to elect uh, to nominate another uh, six or so so you see that is a cost now if across the counties you multiply six by 47 or even four by 47 or whatever average you take, there is an economic cost. So we need to help our citizenry, our electorate understand the cost of one, not electing women, and the cost of not having women on the table. So what we are doing is to actually reverse this so that we can provide a demand-driven sort of um, uh, civic education that helps the electorate to see that we are the losers we need the women so we need to shift the, the the burden and we are trying to shift the burden and we've got to shift that burden from the women leaders and take it to the to directly to the to the electorate but on the same note we've got to also shift that burden to the other duty bearers because they are duty bearers here there is the electoral uh, emb the electoral management body in our case the iebc we have the political parties and all of these got to bear their their responsibilities and i think that because part of the reason is not adhering to the rule of every political party list has to have a third at least not more than two thirds those rules political parties need to feel the pain and the punishment so there is a bit of reforming the electoral systems reforming our laws but also making sure that the those who do not adhere to the law actually feel the pain they're punished so the punishment is not there it's not tough enough you get away with so much if you don't elect women and that shouldn't be shouldn't continue to be the case and so the what is at stake here is also the fact that society will continue we, our country will continue to to be another dog in the face of of other nations you know we pride ourselves as being a democratic country with a very good progressive constitution so it really behoves on us to up our game so that then we can be properly on the table and reclaim our image because as long as we continue to look down on the women's leadership that isn't very good for our peer it's not very good for our for our look and feel so a lot of things uh you may see are at stake when we do not elect women now again if we do not change our perspectives and make these electoral systems an environment safer for women what it means is that women will be afraid girls will be afraid everybody will be afraid to put their name on the ballot and our society will be the the the, the poorer and so i think we do need to reform certain things in our laws in our political parties act in our electoral uh, acts so that we we can really build in mechanisms and safeguards for the women before our uh, during and after the general election. And, and, and finally, let me say right now, we're looking at a society that is not prepared even for women's leadership. We are wrestling with what do spouses of our female governors, what is their role? What does the law say about them? You know, we have clear, laws and practices and traditions about first ladies what about first gentlemen now if we don't address these issues now there will be a rollback to all the gains we have made and this this dream to actualize um uh sdg number five on women and gender equality will continue to be a mirage and god forbid that we we get to that situation so these are urgent issues that we need to address at national local regional and even at the international levels so that because kenya's case is not unique in any way and for those women who have been elected into political spaces what would your advice be to them especially you know, some of the things you said around mainstreaming women's issues and preparing the society for women to be able to see women in leadership positions and supporting the environment to be enabling for more women to enter. So 
so so that we can achieve and even go beyond um, the various gender quotas in Kenya's case, two third gender principle. You know, Emese, I, what we've been, you and I have been talking about this morning is, is really about access, how we get more women on the table, how we get more girls to be on the leadership spaces. And so this is all about access. So we uh, from Eco Network African Democracy Transfer think that we need to get our women leaders even the, before they get to parliament and to the to leadership, we need to get them to agree on an agenda. Every woman leader must have an agenda so that you're not just an, there as a woman. You're actually there as a leader with an agenda. So we are saying we need to move the women from access to agenda and finally to accountability so that they are accountable to the women fraternity. They are also accountable to the gender, to the cause for women, and they're also accountable to the electorate. So we need to move them from access to uh, agenda to accountability and all those things need to go together. So we again that I go back to the first point that I made that these programs and initiatives really should be more of a cycle, not an event, because once you have access to leadership, so what? If you don't do something, if you don't do anything to your electorate, you will be voted out for sure. And in Kenya, we know that 70 to 80 percent of our elected members get voted out. I think we are a society that votes people out more than votes them in. And therefore, there is a lot of work to be done. And this is not work by one actor. We got to work together every actor doing their bit, those who are providing capacity to get women to access leadership, then others pick it up and they help them build their agenda and deliver on their communities and then accountability. And that way we'll progressively build on the women's leadership in a way that is credible, in a way that is accountable, and in a way that will drive demand other than driving it as a right-based approach. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Sarah. Today we've been talking about women's equal participation in electoral process for political stability and sustainable peace. So to finish off our conversation, if there was one action you would like our listeners to take today in relation to all that we've talked about, what would that be? I think for me, the action I'd like our listeners to take is to take the issue of women's leadership as an important issue, not just an issue for the women, that it is our business. It is the business of the voter. It's the business for political parties. It's the business for EMBs. It's our business to get all people on the table for of leadership, men, women, boys, and girls, that this issue of women's leadership needs to be embraced as a national issue, as an international issue, not as an issue for the woman. It is our problem, not somebody else's problem. That for me is the thing and that it matters to have women on the table. It matters that we have women leading both men, women, boys, and girls. That would be my parting shot, Yemisi. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you very much, Yemisi. It's been very nice talking to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to She Stands for Peace, the podcast series where thought leaders and peace builders share their reflections and best practices in the Women, Peace and Security agenda in Africa. I am Dr. Yemsi Akimbobola, and this podcast was produced by the United Nations Office to the African Union with the generous support of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Don't forget to join the conversation using the hashtag SheStandsForPeace. Peace.